Today's video is sponsored by Delete Me. Sometimes some things seem like a really good idea in principle, up until a point someone points out that those pesky laws of physics means it's actually really much, much more difficult to do than it looks. One of those ideas is the space elevator, something that's been around as an idea since 1895, but it wasn't until the 1960s that it was actually thought possible. And since then, there has been a lot of work being done on the likes of NASA, the Japanese Space Agency, and private companies to try and make it a reality. But as of yet, it's a bit like creating a fully functioning fusion reactor in that it's just around the corner, but we appear to be going around a giant roundabout. The basic idea is pretty simple. You place a satellite in a geosynchronous orbit around the Earth at 35,768 kilometers so that it stays in the same place above the surface. You then lower a 35,768 kilometer long cable down to the Earth and fix it in position, while at the same time, a counterweight would be attached to another cable. But this time, the counterweight would be extended away from a satellite in the opposite direction into space. This would allow the center of mass to stay in the position of the geostationary satellite. You then use climbers, similar to lift cars, to climb up and down the cable to deliver goods and people into space, far more cost effectively on a cost per kilogram basis than launching a rocket. At a speed of 300 km per hour, it would still take about five days for the climber to reach the satellite, and more if it were to go higher and reach escape velocity orbit on the outward extending tether. But as I say, the devil is in the details, and in this case, the details are mostly revolving around the laws of physics. It was the Russian scientist Konstantin Tsiolkovsky in 1895 who, inspired by the Eiffel Tower, proposed building a tower from the Earth up to the geostationary orbit at 35,768 kilometers. Any objects which climbed up the tower would attain a horizontal velocity. If a satellite were to be released at the top of a tower, it would stay at that point in the orbit and not fall back down to Earth. The problem here is that the weight of the tower would be so great that its base would have to be hundreds of kilometers across so that it wouldn't buckle under its own weight. This was clearly an impractical idea. But some 60 odd years later in 1960, it was independently developed by another Russian scientist called Yuri Arsutinov and in the mid-1970s by the American Jerome Pearson. Both used the idea of a geostationary satellite, which we've just spoke about, and they tethered it to the Earth via a very long cable. Though Pearson, who didn't know about Arsutinov's work, went much further as he was an aerospace engineer for both NASA and the Air Force Research Laboratory, and did much more research into every aspect of it. The idea remained obscure until 1979 when Arthur C. Clarke published his sci-fi novel The Fountains of Paradise, in which engineers built a space elevator on top of a mountain on a fictional island at the equator. Now, while these ideas seem all well and good on the surface, the geostationary satellite with a cable hanging down to the Earth suffers the same problem as building the giant tower as proposed by Tsiolkovsky in that the weight of the cable hanging down from the top would be so great as it would snap before it ever made it to the Earth's surface. This is of course assuming it was made of something like steel, which most elevator cables are constructed from. Arsutinov realized the issue and suggested that the cable would get progressively thicker as it went higher and higher up until it reached its maximum width, where it would be attached to the satellite. This is so the stress along the cable would remain consistent at any point along its length. This varying thickness is called the taper. At the very top of the cable, it would support the weight of all the cable below it, whereas at the bottom of the cable, it would be attached to the earth and it would be very thin because there was no weight pulling down on it at the earth end. And of course, you would still need to allow for the weight of the climbers and the load being transported, plus a safety margin. This is where the laws of physics really start to mess with your ideas. Steel is a very strong material, but it's also heavy with a specific strength of 0.63 megapascals. The longest theoretical steel cable that could be hung vertically without snapping under its own weight would be about 10 to 12 kilometers. 
depending upon the type of steel, the construction and its breaking strength. But when you get into lengths of hundreds or tens of thousands of kilometers, it isn't strong enough to hold up its own weight without becoming exponentially thicker at one end. I've been on the World Wide Web since 1993, almost since it went public. And over those years, I've seen it grow from basic websites to the complete digital ecosystem that it's become today. Back then, I think few, if anyone thought about having their personal details harvested from websites to be bought and sold by anonymous companies to anyone willing to pay for it. But 30 years on and the digital revolution that many of us dreamed about has turned into a digital nightmare for some. Our dependence on all things digital has turned what was private and confidential into now just a huge revenue source for the online tech giants and it's fueled by data brokers, companies that buy and sell data to anyone that wants it. This can include emails, names, current and past addresses, phone numbers, age, occupation, and much, much more. If you work in places like the government or the military, civil services, or you have a high profile, this data can be a security or even a personal safety risk. You can request these companies delete the data they hold on you, but with well over 750 data brokers around the world, where do you start? And this is where today's sponsor, Delete Me, comes in. Delete Me has been helping normal people like you and I get their personal information removed from data brokers since 2010 in the US, UK, and Europe. Delete Me is simple to use. You just select the plan you want, fill in the online application, and Delete Me will contact the hundreds of data brokers to remove you from their lists. You receive regular privacy reports to show how much data was found, where it was found, and where it was removed from. You can do this for yourself or for your family. And if you use the joindeleteme.com forward slash droid link in the description below, or you scan the QR code next to me today, you'll get a 20% discount. So if you value your privacy, I'd check them out now. If you look at the taper ratio for some materials, steel, while being strong, has a way greater density. So its taper ratio will be 1.6 times 10 to the power of 33. This means that to hold a cable up made out of steel vertically, which will be 35,768 kilometers long, will mean the thickness of the cable at the top will be wider than the known universe. That's a bit of a problem. Any material with a specific strength of greater than 48 megapascals will have a much lower taper ratio. If you look at single wall carbon nanotubes, it has a tensile strength 26 times that of steel and a specific strength of 100. So its taper ratio is only 1.6. Whatever material is used, it has to be not only incredibly strong, but incredibly light. So far, carbon nanotubes are among the best thing we've got. These are made up of football-shaped molecules, which are made up of 60 carbon atoms, which are then stretched to create a tube-like structure. In computer simulations, a thread just one millimeter in diameter had a theoretical breaking length of greater than 10,000 kilometers and could hold a mass of 20 tons. However, the problem here is that the longest carbon nanotube we've been able to make so far is about half a meter long. And no one quite knows how to make a 100,000 kilometer long thread required to build a space elevator. And this is where the focus has been on, to try and create materials that have a very high tensile strength to density ratio. The newest so far has been graphene ribbons made of a perfect two-dimensional sheet of carbon which are expected to have breaking lengths of between five and 6,000 kilometers and a specific strength of 60 megapascals. However, if this were to be done on Mars, it would be much easier. The gravity on Mars is 38% that of Earth, yet it rotates at a similar speed of that of the Earth. This means that the tether required for a space elevator on Mars will be much shorter as the aerostationary orbit is only 17,032 kilometers thus requiring much lower specific strength. Existing materials such as Kevlar will be strong enough to produce a tether there. The only other problem with Mars is, apart from getting there, is that the Martian moon Phobos is in a low orbit, which intersects the equator twice a day where the elevator would be placed. But there is a silver lining in that Phobos is projected to contain a high amount of carbon. So if carbon nanotubes were to be the tether material, 
there could be a large amount near Mars without having to rely upon it being shipped from Earth. All of these ideas assume that we have a method of getting the materials required into orbit on a much greater quantity basis than now, and it might take hundreds or thousands of launches in order to build the first space elevator. It would also rely upon possibly the capture of an asteroid to make the counterweight, but another way would be maybe to capture some of the space junk in the nearby graveyard orbits and from the lower orbits. But we still haven't been able to come up with an idea of how to do this en masse, so it might be easier to try and capture the asteroid. However, once the first space elevator was built, the following ones would be a lot easier because they could use the first one to carry the material up into orbit to build them. Once the space elevator has been built, and if a counterweight cable could be used as the launching platform, and if it reached out to a radius of 53,100 kilometers, then a space probe launched from there would be at escape velocity from Earth. Other proposals by Jerome Pearson were to have a 144,000 kilometer long cable. If this were so, then the velocity at the end of it would be great enough to send probes as far out as Jupiter. In the last 20 years, there has been a lot of discussions about the creation of space elevators, but at the end of the day, it will be our ability to create a tether light enough, strong enough and long enough that will determine if this idea ever gets off the ground, pun intended. So I hope you enjoyed the video and a big thanks go to all of our patrons for their ongoing support.